like it's not like being up here all over. I think that's right. Yeah, it shows. I'm just excited and we'll give it to you all in the We can switch it. Are you serious? Oh, that was fine. No, no, no. My room. All right, ladies and gentlemen, last class. You ready to be done with me? That was the wrong answer. <laughs> He's like, get the hell out of here. Um, Anyway, thank you. I, I, I enjoy this more than you'll ever know. It's an honor to teach you all. I know you don't believe me, or I don't feel that way, but uh, I, I'm very fortunate to do this for a living, and uh, you all do great things in your own way, so I'm very happy to be with you all. Um, any questions before we get started? Things in your mind? All right. My goal for today... Everyone trickles in after I start. My goal for today is to go over part two of the 2018 final. Did any of you go to the Langdale this weekend? That's what I thought. Anyway, well, <laughs> Brie went over part one of the final. So there you go. Um, I hope some of you have already did this one. If not, this class will not be very useful, but maybe you will soon. Uh, I would encourage you in the strongest possible terms to take as many of these exams as you can before the final. Um, if you notice, I'm not giving you any new readings last week. I gave you time to do this. And if you chose something else at the time, that's your problem. Not <laughs> mine, or I guess it'll be mine one after grade. Uh, uh, but that, that's where we are. All right, so let me start at the very beginning. Uh, for those of you who came to my Langdell session a few weeks ago, this will be a lot of repetition, but those who didn't, I will do it all for you fresh and clean. Um, the exam itself is three hours long. It's meant to be finished in three hours. Uh, the number one reason people don't do well is they don't finish. And the reason why they don't finish is they don't use their time wisely. Okay. Uh, the exam has two parts, part one and part two each worth 50%. That means is you spend no more than 90 minutes in part one and no more than 90 minutes in part two. If you find yourself spending two hours on the first part, guess what? You're not going to finish. And if you think part one's hard, part two's going to be harder because you're going to be tired and burned out and you won't have enough energy to go through. So as you're taking the exam, when you get to the 90-minute mark, stop. Go into part two. Okay. The other major constraint, as I mentioned many times, is the word limit. The word limit, right? Part one and part two. Part one is 1,000 words. Part two is 2,000 words. Not 1,500 and 500. Not 1,800 and 200. 1,000 and 1,000. In the exam solve, you can do a word count. It's a little bit tricky. You'll see there's a little character count feature, a little document icon, a piece of paper. Click that, the word count will pop up. If you don't know what I just said, that's fine. Do a sample exam, so I'll have to exam and try it out. You do not want to have to figure this out when you're under this exam. That would not be a good use of your time. And within the word count, if you have a thousand words for part one, and each part is five questions, well then simple math says roughly 200 words per question. That's not a line rule, but it's a good guide. Because if you spend 800 words on the first question, then you have nothing left for the rest of the paper, and I stop reading. Yes, I will stop reading in a thousand words. That's another reason people score poorly. I don't read their part five. I just don't get to the fifth question. Okay, I'll keep going. Each question is graded on a scale of one to ten. 
right? Um, I'll explain during the session what is a 10, what's a 9, what's an 8, and so on. But just so you know, if you get somewhere around an 80 out of 100, you're on track for an A. If you get somewhere around a 70 out of 100, you're on track for a B. If you're closer to a 60, you're probably in the C range. And if you're below that, you're in trouble. And I think I gave you a warning. There might be a failure in this class. I don't know. I, I, I stopped calling people, so I don't know where you're at. Uh, but that's just my guess, uninformed. We'll see. Um, the exam, again, is completely open book. Your notes will not help you, which is why it's open book. Um, if you're simply copying rule statements from your outline, congratulations, you wasted time in your word count. I will not give you credit for something you can copy from your notes. I said again, if you're just copying something from your notes, I will not give you credit for it because you've not shown me you've done anything but copy stuff from your notes. That's not, that's not, that's not credit, right? In terms of the Iraq, I want the A, the analysis. That's where the money is, right? That's where you get the big bucks. And that's all you have space for. You only have 200 words, five or six sentences, maybe seven sentences. That's not a lot of space. <coughs> Right. If you don't know what 200 words looks like, just go to Word and type an answer and see what that is. All right. Uh, what are your notes good for? Let's see if you get a case name, or maybe you don't remember, you know, uh, whether some rule is modern or common law. Right. Those sorts of small things are useful to quickly reference it. A lot of students use they have a very short outline that just has like a one sentence summary with all the cases and their facts, like one sentence, maybe two. That might be useful. Uh, if you're flipping through your case book, you are not going to finish, right? You're just using your time poorly. Okay. And again, especially with the evening students, they find the biggest obstacle is, is the time. Uh, just, just year after year teaching this class, I find a lot of people, they just don't get to the last question. It's just blank. I get, and that's a big zero, right? If you leave it blank, you get a zero. So write something, right? I don't care. Don't leave a, a question blank. Um, I, I was assured that you'll have a paper copy of the exam to read. I pray they do it, but that was my assurance, and I, I, I made that assurance. If, if it actually gets done, that's beyond my control, but I did ask for paper copies of the exam. Uh, on the exam soft, there are going to be two parts. Make sure you click next. Right? If you only do part one, you get a 50. That happened, I think I mentioned during the pandemic, one student didn't click the next button and skipped half the exam. Leslie, it was a pass-fail semester. I passed a student, advanced my better judgment. Uh, failure to read instructions is bad, but that's where we are. Uh, please don't, I don't think anyone here is dumb enough to cheat. I hope you're not. It's, we catch people. We actually had a student this past semester who we caught the person cheating and we got them to actually admit to it. And, and I don't think they're here anymore. Uh, so they cheat on the final exam. Uh, it's not common. It happens every couple of years that we catch them, which means it probably happens more that we don't catch them. That's just, just, you know how numbers work, uh, but it, it's it's very dumb. Um, again, on this exam, the questions are such that cheating will not do you good. If you ask someone for help, who knows if they even know the answer? Uh, if you ask Chat GPT for help, good luck. Uh, I'm actually going to try. I, I'm going to give my exam to Chat GPT compared to the average paper. I just want to see where it is. Uh, no, I'm serious. I, I I'm curious how I'll do my exam. I think. Some of my colleagues have said ChatGPT is pulling Bs on their exam. We'll see. My exam's a little bit hard, but we'll see if we can figure out my, my, my wrinkles. Um, all right. Questions so far? Yes, Brian? Did you mention whether the physical notes or are we. Paper, 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 paper. It's got to be on paper. No, no iPad, no laptop, no Control F, no search. Okay, everything's got to be on paper. And, and the reason why is it should be obvious. It's too hard to please cheating when you have your laptop open, right? I actually did a poll on this some years ago. Someone said, "What well, if we bring like a tablet or a device?" And there's no way of stopping cheating. Uh, so it's just it's too risky. So paper. It's locked down, right? So your computer is is locked down. Don't hack it, please. Your computer is locked down such that you can only see the screen, for example, if you can't see anything else in your hard drive. Um, I remember when I was in law school years ago, I had a Mac, and you would actually run what was called a virtual PC, so you say parallels today. So you could actually run an instance of, of Windows on your Mac, and the dean's like, no, you can't do that. So basically, you can run two OSs at the same time. You would boot into Anyway, so I had to actually get a, a PC that it worked for this. Anyway, they, they've since fixed that, but but originally there was, there was no Mac version of um. Exam soft when I was in law school. 
Yeah, Brian. Um, so um, I noticed that most of your exams are the same format, with the exception of some of them. The older ones? Some of the older ones, I think there's a few new terms that are longer form. In recent years, I've gone shorter. That's more indicative of what I would give. I, the older exams, like in 2012 and 13 or 14, I try giving much longer fact patterns, and there's some pros and cons. More recently, as I've settled on shorter fact patterns, I think they, they're not easier. Because if I give you more stuff, there's more stuff for you to write about. That's why it's actually misleading. It's actually, the shorter the exam is, the harder it is because the less I'm giving you. So it's actually trickier. All right, any other questions? All right. Um, I know this sounds stupid, but the first thing you should do is read the instructions. Um, if you skip the instructions, you will miss stuff. I give you very important information. So in part one, which I did not assign, I tell you I'm applying all common law rules. That's useful. So there's actually a jurisdiction that's modern. You're not going to follow that jurisdiction. I tell you that you're bound by the U.S. Constitution. That's very useful information. Why? Because there's some takings question. right? There's a question on the due process clause. So I say you're bound by the Constitution. There are only so many questions I can ask based on this. I'm giving you a hint of what's on the exam. If I tell you that the statute of limitations is five years, what am I asking about? Adverse possession or prescription, right? So just by reading three lines of the instructions, I just given away a lot of information. Um, also, consistently, consistently, <laughs> students don't read the instructions, so they don't get the right jurisdiction. They miss the law. They'll apply, you know, a race statute when it's a race notice jurisdiction, right? They'll, they'll use a five-year limitation period instead of tax. Oh, there's not the limitation in Texas. No. Follow the instructions. One other point, and I'll, I'll just make this point at the outset. In almost every exam, my question is this. How should the court resolve this dispute? Right? I always ask the question in maybe slightly different ways. I want you to answer that damn question. Tell me the court should rule for A. The court should rule for B. There is adverse possession. There is not adverse possession. Like the first sentence or the last sentence should be an answer to that question. You will see today, to my frustration, that even the A-plus student didn't do that. Right? But you need to answer the damn question. How should the court resolve it? A wins. B wins. C wins. D wins. Right? Give me an answer. If you just say, here are all these things and just sort of let me figure it out, I'm not giving you full credit. All right? Now let me tell you what makes a good answer from a bad answer. Right? Of course you have to, to answer the question. But what I'm trying to look at is how thorough is a student approaching it? So if you just leave a blank, okay, that's a zero. Right? You're getting 0 0.710. I don't think anyone would disagree with that one. If you write what I call the desperation answer where you just write some one sentence of gibberish, They'll give you a point or two, right? But in earnest, if you actually try it, you're starting with a five or a six, right? That's usually where my, where my baseline is. Like on the SAT, you get points for writing your name, right? If you actually just do some sort of like effort of writing something, start with a five or a six. Okay, so, so what's a six? You sort of identified the issue. You didn't really answer the question correctly. You didn't even give me any authority, but you sort of spied the issue. Okay, I'll, I'll give you six points for that. All right, what, what, what about for seven points? Well, seven points is okay. You spied the issue. And then maybe like you hinted at the right answer, but didn't quite get it. That's you know, seven points, right? Okay, now what do you want for eight points? Uh, eight points is, okay, you spotted the issue, you're giving me some analysis, and you kind of got it right, or at least it's mostly right. Maybe you have some authority. Maybe not as much authority as they want, but you got most authority. And eight's good. If you get straight eights, you're on track for an A or an A minus, right? That, that's actually really good. Um, yes, okay, Josh, nine. What do you do for a nine? Um, Nine is you've, you've answered the question, you got all the answers right, or at least you give me a correct answer. There's, there's always one or two right answers, so you've given me a, a correct answer. And also you've given me really good authority. You said this case is like, you know, Kilo because of like this, or this case is like Shelly V. Kramer because of this reason, right? You've given me authority and you've sort of distinguished it, or said why the authority is on point. Okay, then, then what's 10, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll remind you, I don't give many tens. In fact, for some exams, I only give a couple tens for the entire section of, you know, 60 or 70 students. So tens are rare, but 10 is pretty much perfect, right? You got the answer exactly to what I was looking for. Uh, you, you discuss all relevant authority, 
and you actually worked in some sort of policy issues about fairness, about equity, about uh, 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 bright line rules versus standards, right? You, you've done a lot of the hard work you've done in class. Uh, again, I've never given 100 in my life. It's never happened. I've given the, I think someone got a 96 once in a midterm. That's the highest I've ever given. Uh, but I've never given that high. So again, if you're in the 80s, you're, you're sitting pretty for an A. You're on track for an A, easy. Right? If you're in the high 80s, maybe we'll get an A+. Plus. If, you, if you get a 90, you're in really good shape. Um, if you're in the mid 70s, that's about a B plus. That's usually where I find. So if you're getting mostly sevens and eights, you're on track for B plus. If you're mostly sixes and sevens, you are on track for a B, B minus. If you get mostly sixes and some fives, you're on track for a C. Uh, and much lower than that, uh, if you get mostly fives, maybe a four or two, you're either a D or an F. So. I know it adds up to 100, and you always try to mix and match. But as you go through the exam today, grade yourself, right? See how, how, how you think you did, assuming you did this one at home. Um, but you want, you want sevens and eights, right? That gets you to an A, or B plus at least. Um, if you get mostly sixes, then OK, then, then, then you're in trouble, OK? Questions on the grading scheme, the sort of the rubric what I'm looking for, Brian? You said he has six. <laughs> he could be a three. You said he could work a sentence, a two, a three. No, that's the five. Oh, the five. Yeah, I, I basically start people off at a five. Six is at least you sort of spotted the issue and you gave me some, some, some intelligible effort of answering the question. Five is I'm like, oh, this is garbage, right? Five, five is like, okay, I, this is basically they're writing your name for the SAT. I sort of start. I was like, okay, you did something. But again, if you only write like a sentence or two, that might be a three or four. If, if it's, you have to at least give me something that's closely approaching 200 words that at least sort of gestures at the issue. I'll give you five points for that. Right, you, you've done something. Greg? You mentioned earlier the conversation between public policy. How does it feel that? That gets you to the 10, yes, sir. How thoroughly you want to do that? Well, I'll show you some answers today from my prior class. And I'll show you how they did it, and you can judge for yourself. These, these, some of these are tens. Well, you got to do a little bit better than that. You know, you could say that the law should not reward those who trespass and do not contribute to property values. Uh, that's a, I mean, that's a better way of saying what you just said, but that would help. Yeah, I'll show you some good answers, and you'll you'll tell me if you think it's good. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it is. Same curve. But let me just say about the curve, the, you guys naturally curve, right? I mean, I'm just looking at you, and I'll just predict there are 25 of you. Look, I, I, I can say this about, there'll be about four or five A's. Four or five A's, maybe nine or ten B's, and the rest of you fall somewhere else. Maybe four or five C and lower. I mean, I, I, I have a... I don't need to use a spreadsheet to, to know that. It's just that in any grouping of students, you all naturally fall along a curve. I know if you ever took statistics in college, but in any population of any size, people fall along a curve. It's, I mean, you're shaking your head. It's not, it's not like I'm doing something like, like evil. Um, like I, I had a class with 11 students last semester. That was actually hard to curve. 11 is actually a pretty small number. But once you get into the 20s, it, it, it curves naturally. So, but yeah, it's it's still the same. The required first year curve. I saw a hand somewhere else over here. Yeah. Basically, you want to deserve being straight common law goals all the time. <laughs> yeah, I said that, didn't I? Yeah. Common law case. No, if I, if I if you got a New Jersey case, it's a pretty good odds. It's a modern rule. Well, Stambowski's curious. I'd assume asking at that earlier. Stambowski still followed the common law rule, which is caveat in tour, but the courts have created an exception to it. So Stambowski kind of a weird one, whether it's common law. Common law. I can go either way. Uh, that's actually not a clear one because the court said we are adhering to the common law rule, which is caveat in tour. That's actually sort of a, 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 again, a lot of these issues are borderline. That's why I said there's not usually one correct answer. There's usually a range of answers I think are good and can be acceptable. So don't, don't think there's only one right answer. Yes. So sometimes there is. Like if there's a covenant question, 
the burden runs or it doesn't, right? There, there's a right answer to that question. But in other questions, there's a range of discretion. Yes, go ahead. Well, look, look, I'll say it this way. I get this question a lot. Um, I usually don't ask the same thing twice, right? So I have 10 questions. I try to 10 topics. If you find yourself repeating yourself, you're probably answering the wrong question. Like I said, as I said in number three, you screw the question up, right? Because I don't ask the same thing twice. Now, maybe I do, and maybe it's obvious, but be hesitant that maybe if you're talking about the same thing twice, you've not hit the right, the right points. Just, just sort of like, that, like to check yourself. That that's a good check. Yes. In some of your questions, you bring you raise alternative points, like you know, for example, Joker may argue this. How does that play into the completeness of the answer? Is that just kind of extra flair, or is uh, flair? I like that word. Right. So I mean, here's where I look at it. I might have a question where I have like eight or nine things I think are relevant. You might write about two or three of those and get get a nine. Right. There's no student who writes a perfect answer. That's why I give you the memo. Because the memo is what I'm thinking of. And indeed, some students think of things I didn't even consider. It happens every semester. So if you didn't get something that the model answer got or my memo had, that's fine. You got other stuff that still might be right. All right, questions? All right, let's go on to the actual, um, the actual exam. And what I'd like to do is go through each of the five questions one at a time show you the model answer, and then I'll call on you if you have any questions, things that maybe you missed or didn't, didn't agree with or whatever, okay. Uh, okay, this is part one, this is the frozen question. You can see I'm usually watching Disney movies with my kids when these things come out. Actually, no, this was fall 2018, Miriam wasn't even born yet. You know what, I wrote this before, her birthday was in December, so I wrote this before the exam. What was the date on this one? She was not born yet, my goodness. Ha. Okay, you were looking forward to frozen. I love Disney movies, by the way, which you probably can tell. Um, most of them, not all of them. Okay. All right, so part two. Read the instructions first, uh, please. It says, in Gotham City, Batman's a superhero who fights evil villains and engages in sophisticated property transactions. Uh, you don't need to know any comic book lore. It's not important for this question, but it makes it easier for me to write them because I get not so bored. Um, please write a memorandum of no more than 1,000 words addressing five property issues affecting Alfred, Batman, Catwoman, Dracula, and Joker. If you couldn't tell, A, B, C, D. Um, I try to give you names in somewhat alphabetical order that makes it easier to sort, and it makes a covenant question a lot simpler. Um, there are also five properties. Cave Acre, Wayne Acre, Bat Acre, Fraud Acre, and Arc Acre. So without reading anything, there's a question about fraud. <laughs> I've started giving you a hint. Uh, about what I'm asking about. I tell you that the Gotham District Court applies all American common law rules. Uh, this is not a surprise. I almost always ask common law rules because the modern rules are like so easy. It's like, oh, whatever is fair. Uh, that's not very good to test on. So I'm usually asking about common law rules. A race notice statute. Okay, that's important. I tell you, I have a, re a recording question and it's not notice. So you have to, not, you have to know the rules of race notice. And I'm telling you the anti-deficiency statute of Texas. Okay, that means there's a mortgage question. I'm telling you that up front. And you have to know what's in the Texas anti-deficiency statute. That was in your notes. It's there. We covered it. And you're bound by the U.S. Constitution. Why am I telling you this? Because I want you to think about a takings question or some sort of question on uh, 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 zoning, something involving the takings clause. Okay? Question so far? My advice to you is read the instructions carefully. Then read through the entire exam top to bottom. Right? Why read through the exam top to bottom? Because there might be something in question two that helps you with question one. Or there might be question, something in question four that jogs your memory in question two. You don't know. And sometimes the questions build on each other, so you don't want to go out of order. Right? Do them. I'm sorry. Read straight through the entire answer top to bottom. Good. All right, let's try number one. This is a lovely question about covenants involving mutually restrictive covenants, if you recall that topic. Okay. So it says Alfred owned Cave Acre and Fee Simple, Batman owned Wayne Acre and Fee Simple. 
the lots border each other. Alfred sold K Baker to Batman with a covenant. <coughs> excuse me, with a covenant that the property could only be used for residential purposes. Batman sold Wayne Acre to Alfred with a covenant that the property could only be used for commercial purposes. So I gave you the memo, and this diagram sums up the transactions. Okay. So after these transactions, Alfred owns Wayne, uh, Wayne Acre which is limited to commercial usage. And then Batman owns Cave Acre, which is limited to residential purposes. <clears throat> Importantly, when these lands were conveyed, they were conveyed with a covenant attached to them. That creates what's called privity of a state, also known as horizontal privity. But see the arrow points both ways, right? Why is that important? Because there's horizontal privity in both ways. Wayneaker has both a benefit and burden. Kaybaker has both a benefit and burden. Or stated differently, Wayneaker is both dominant and servient. Batman, I'm sorry, Kaybaker is both dominant and servient. Why does that matter? Because you have benefits and burdens running on both sides. Again, you have benefits and burden running on both sides. This is what we call the mutually restrictive covenant. Everyone with me so far? Everyone get the diagram so far? All right, so then we learn in the next sentence, excuse me, Batman sells Wayne Acre to Alfred. I'm sorry, next sentence, I'm sorry, wrong sentence. Alfred sells Dracula, who is a DC character, I looked it up, Yes, I, I, well, I, I actually fact checked my exams with with, with uh, pop culture. I I once had a Back to the Future trilogy. It was part one and part two. I, I did the entire movie. Uh, I've done a lot of those over the years. They're kind of fun. It was it was a, it was a property one exam with time travel that went back with the future interest. It was, it was it was fun. Students maybe didn't like it, but I enjoyed it. Um, Alfred sells Dracula life estate in Wayne Acre. Okay, there's the life estate. What does that mean? When Alfred sells Dracula life estate, that is enough for the benefit to run. He goes, if any interest is conveyed, the benefit will run. And what is that benefit? The benefit is that K Baker remains limited to residential construction. But will the burden run from A to D? No. Why? In order for the burden to run, the entire bundle of sticks must be conveyed. Dracula only gets a life estate, not the full bundle of sticks. So Dracula has the benefit, but not the burden. So can Dracula be sued if he builds a house? No, he cannot. Only Alfred can be sued because he remains in privity with Batman. Okay. On the other side, we see that um, Batman sells Cave Acre to Catwoman. Ah, this one's in fee simple. Why is that important? Because on this side, does the benefit run to Catwoman? Yes, Catwoman has a benefit because she has a fee simple. And what's that benefit? The benefit is that Wayne Acre remains commercial. Does the burden run from Batman to Catwoman? Yes, it does run because the full bundle of six was conveyed. Call it a vertical proof if you want. I don't like that, but you can. So Catwoman has both the benefit and the burden. D only has the benefit, but not the burden. We learn that Dracula builds a house and Catwoman builds a factory. Okay? And we learn who sues whom? Dracula sues Catwoman for an injunction to stop the factory. Right? Dracula sues Catwoman to enjoin the operation of the factory. Catwoman sues Dracula to demolish the house. So again, go back to our diagram. D sues C and C sues D. And they both seek injunctions. Okay. So let's start off. Can Dracula sue Catwoman? Yeah. Because Catwoman has both the burden. She has the burden. Dracula has the benefit. That works. Can Dracula seek an injunction? Wait a minute. What's the remedy for real covenant law? Damages. Only damages. What gets you injunctions? Equitable servitude. So I'm asking, how should the court resolve this dispute? 
you can say that there's a real covenant law. Draco can sue Catwoman. But the remedy is one of damage is not an injunction. That's actually answering the damn question. Can Catwoman sue Dracula? The answer is no. Because Dracula does not have the burden. Catwoman would have to sue Alfred, who could then go after Dracula as his tenant. Okay? <coughs> but again, no injunction there. Now, Catwoman could perhaps seek an injunction based on equitable servitude against Dracula. Maybe she can do that. <coughs> Then you'd have to discuss whether there's an equal servitude. All right. Yeah. I've read in my notes. Not 13, the second covenant class. Um, that you had said always include an equitable servitude analysis. You should. Covenant back pattern. You should. It's a good memory you have there. You should. Because in almost every exam question where I'm asking a covenant, if the burden doesn't run, for example, double back to an equal servitude. There's nothing stopping you. All right, you can always consider that. Uh, let's see the A-plus answer here. Yeah, Lens, go ahead. You sure? Go ahead. Go for it. So, when I wrote mine, I wrote, I guess, a partial conclusion first to answer the question. I, I said, uh, I started with to settle this dispute, the total will dismiss Catwoman's case into a lack of a covenant and dismiss Dracula's enjoyment of the factory on K Baker. Then I ran through my analysis and then I ended with why they should dismiss it. You can do that. Look, you can put the conclusion up front. That's nice. Or put it at the end. Was it Kriak? You can put a beginning or the end. That's fine. As long as you answer the damn question. You'll see over here, my friend from 2018, I don't think answered the damn question. Um, and I, I don't hate to keep beating on my former students, but I'm trying to at least make an example that that, that maybe this semester you'll... Uh, uh, oh no, this one actually, I think, more or less did it. The other ones were not so much. Okay, so begin. Under the common law... Okay. The first two sentences here are irrelevant. They give me what it means for burden to run, what horizontal privity is. None of that's useful for me. Zero. I would just give that zero credit. So they just wasted oh, about 75 words or so. All right. I know I'm going to give 50 words. Okay. Starting here. Here there's horizontal privity because Alfred sold cave acre to Batman with the restriction reserve. Correct. There is vertical privity because Batman sold cave acre to Catwoman in fee simple, meaning he conveyed his full interest. Correct. And I think what you really have to say is the burden runs from B to C. He doesn't quite say that, but he says vertical privity, which is, you know, close. Dracula can sue Catwoman because there was no requirement of horizontal or vertical privity for the benefit to run a common law. Correct. Wait a minute. Um, Dracula can sue Catwoman because there's no requirement. I'm not sure even sure what that is. Anyone know? I, I, that's just that's confused. I I have no idea. That's just confused. But but the answer is that. But typically, the remedy for violation of a covenant is damages on injunction. That's correct. But that doesn't actually answer the question what the court should do though. Right. If you notice, they didn't actually answer the question. They kind of did, but not really. Um, the next paragraph, the student wrote, and I again, I have no idea who the student is, so I apologize. I'm criticizing my former students. Catwoman cannot sue Dracula to enforce the commercial purposes covenant because there is not vertical privity between A and D. Correct. The bird did not run. However, Catwoman may try to sue because of the previous state when we acres were injured conveyed. And this is uh, Aaron's question. If they cannot enforce the covenant, argue is an equal servitude. That's good. Uh, Catmull will argue that Batman intended to maintain the restriction. It touches the land and upons it. It doesn't really explain why. I would like to see why does it touch the land. That, that'd be nice. One sentence. But it's clear that Dracula had actual constructive notice for any reason to inquire about the restriction. Again, doesn't say what the court should do. Should the court enforce the equal servitude or not? I think it soon as leaning towards yes, but I'd like an answer. Okay, so again, I would say that's right, an eight or a nine. You might say, "Oh, Josh, it's garbage answer." Huh. Wait till I see all of yours after exam day, right? Uh, and I, I don't mean this to criticize you, but it's a lot easier to sit here in a nice class from criticizing a student versus taking one under time and pressure, right? You don't put your best work out when you're under the exam. It's just that's just that's how it works. Yeah, one and two. Where's this you're looking? Oh, here it is. Yeah, I think this can be deleted. It doesn't serve any purpose. I mean, it's just, it's just again, restating what's in your notes. I would you know, save, save your words. I, there were several sentences here that I would just cut out. Good. Yeah, good. 
Yeah, I, I, I would not really mention that unless you're saying that here Alfred had the intent to bind successors. I, I would, 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 whenever you want to give me a rule, just like give me the rule as applied to this case. You might say that Alfred had an intent to bind successors when he created the covenant. That's good. Okay, so that does make one. But, but it, you're not just copying from your notes, you're actually putting into the sentence the names of the people who are involved. Does that make sense? He's not here, my, my last day of class. Yeah. He's got it. Okay. Is he okay? No, he's got it. He'll be good. He doesn't need to come. All right. What are the questions number one? Yeah, you're right here. I don't uh, go anywhere. So if we start talking in a covenants question, if we start talking about a signs, are we going to be way off? Because what do you mean a signs? So I, I kind of saw it as basically, you know, Catwoman gained the assignment of horizontal privity from Batman at the sale. Of K Baker, mm -hmm. and then um, she has the assign via property. What do you mean? What do you mean assign? I mean, it, I mean she essentially the assignee. Is that what you're saying? I, I'm kind of seeing her as an assignee because I'm making the equitable servitude argument from Nepongo as well. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, because you the court in Nepongo said they didn't need privity of the state. That's correct. Um, for the for the burden to run. For the, so that's why I I actually said that. The suit would be permissive but under as a servitude. Yeah, and the claimants uh, would likely prevail in each. And yeah, and and you can get the injunction. If, I mean, look, if you do say equal servitude, then you get an injunction. Oh, right? okay. That that would be the remedy so you could I seek. I wouldn't wreck myself if I don't mention the damages versus injunction. Well, again, market. again, this is why in a question there might be eight or nine things I'm looking for. If you get three or four of them, you're in good shape. Okay. But if there are a lot. It, it, I don't give many tens. A ten means like, wow, this person got just everything I was looking. For. That that's rare. Craig, was your hand up? All right. Other questions, number one, things that you thought of. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't get this one, if you're sitting here sort of confused, um, I ask my covenants every year. I, I'm not giving away a, a secret. I do, I do a covenant question every year, an Ethan question every year. So you're going to get this. So make sure you get the covenants issue. Was it a hand? Um, Never mind. Okay. Withdrawn. Yes, chief. Good. Uh, uh, how would you use Sanborn? I think that might be that might be right. Are there enough facts? Yeah, are there enough facts here to get the, the sort of the, the notice for Sanborn? That's why I don't think it's necessarily a good case. That's why this case is maybe is not a good fit for this problem. That's probably not what I'm looking for. In, in other words, if you're inventing facts, then you're probably not writing about the right, the correct thing, because I got I got facts there that I do want you to address. Uh, I've asked questions based on Sanborn before, like you're you're in a residential community, everything's residential, then you can bring in Sanborn. All right, questions are number one. Nothing in number one. All right, let's look at number two then. Uh, this is a recording statute question. Um, and usually when I ask these sorts of recording questions, I'm going to give you a chronology. I might give you dates, you know, in January and February and so on. Here I give you the days of the week to make it a little bit easier. Okay, so it says, on Monday, Joker sells Frodegger to Alfred. Okay. At that point, was Alfred a BFP? Probably, yeah. There's no evidence that there was a prior transaction that he was aware of. On Tuesday, Joker sells Frodacre to Batman, who does not know about Alfred's deed. Is Batman a BFP? Seems like it. But remember, we are not in a notice jurisdiction. We are in a race notice jurisdiction. And in a race notice jurisdiction, it's not enough to be a bona fide purchaser for value. You must be bona fide and be the first to record. So if you skip the instructions, you'll get this question 100% wrong. <clears throat> what if you skip the instructions and then did an analysis for notice, race notice, and then make the survey? You did all the above? Yeah. Because you skipped the instructions? Yeah, I skipped the instructions and I did an analysis <laughs> on all of them. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'd have to see it, but it depends how thorough your answer was to the race notice. We'll get credit for the other two. 
So, I mean, but you're probably capping yourself at like a six or a seven at that point, just based on the number of words you have. But he, you agree reading instructions is a good idea? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> yeah. Read the instructions. I mean, it's like three sentences. And, and I tell, I burn people on this every year, right? And it's just, you know, I, I remember I had a, um, uh, an exam in college. And um, one of the questions is like, what color is this exam, right? And there was, a, there was like an instruction, like this exam is red, like in the instruction. And so it was just really science. Did you read the instructions? No. Well, no, we, I did. I told you it's race notice. And, 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 and it was, I did. Oh, that'd be nice. No. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's read it. All right. Um, okay, on Wednesday, Alfred goes to Gotham City Hall to record his deed for Frodacre. Okay. The clerk accepts the deed, and he records in the Grand Tour Index. But forgets to record in the Grand T Index. Okay, why is this fact significant? Because when you are a buyer, you generally start your search in which index? The grantee index, because you know the name of the person who sold it to you. But does this render the recording irrelevant? I think the answer is not, because if you know that you're buying something from Joker, a competent title searcher would search the name Joker in both grantee and grantor indexes. So you'd come across the Alfred deed. And if you see it's in one book, not the other, you'd be like, whoa, what's going on here? Maybe this is very suspicious. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Right. Uh, and then you think, wait a minute, Josh, isn't that a huge burden to have to search two indexes? We have Orvi Buyer, right? The item Sonan's case, right? What burdens do you impose? You have Harper vs. Paradise, right? The, 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 the case where the deed was missing and found in a chest somewhere. What are the sort of duties to find a red flag that might, make, might not make you a BFP? But I think here, and maybe I'm wrong, the better answer is that the recording was sufficient because it was in one of the books. Okay, then we see on Thursday, Joker sold the office of Frodecker to Catwoman. Catwoman does a title search. She doesn't find, or we don't think she finds, the deed from Alfred from Joker to Alfred. But again, if she knows Joker's there, she would probably search Joker's name everywhere. Maybe go all the way top, all the way bottom, right? And if she finds this deed from Joker to Alfred, <laughs> she should not have bought it. So I don't think Catwoman's a BFP. I don't think she is. I mean, you can make the argument, maybe you can persuade me, but I think she's not a BFP. So even though she records, she's not a BFP. So who actually wins here? I think it's Alfred. I think Alfred wins. He was BFP when he purchased it, and he was the first to record. Wait a minute, Josh. The government only recorded half of it you know, in one of the books. I think it's good enough, right? He went to the office. He did his due diligence. I think I'm balanced court rule in favor of Alfred here. All right, questions in this one. Did you get the race notice part correct? Assuming that was the jurisdiction? Yeah, Good. Um, Good. But I also, in my analysis, I put in there that uh, since there was no information about B uh, running a title search or looking in the index or anything like that, that he should be allowed, or well, he, he uh, recorded second anyway, but I went into the house because he didn't try to do a search. He was, was not BFP. I think you can make that argument, yeah. Aaron? <clears throat> Would it be worth a point to to mention that Catwoman should have had record or inquiry notice? Absolutely, yeah. That's Harper against Paradise, right? I think she had record notice or at least inquiry notice. That's absolutely correct. That's why she's not a BFP. She loses anyway, but she's not a BFP. I don't think. Yes, once. So, in, say you did something like this, where you don't specifically say that Catwoman found anything out. I was actually very vague in that point. I didn't. I, I I left that one open deliberately. Yeah. Well, I didn't say whether Catwoman found anything, but I think she's not BFP in either case. It, if she found it, definitely not a BFP. And if she didn't find it, it was due to a lack of due diligence. So she's not a BFP in either case. <laughs> No replevin, that's not the answer here. No replevin? 
I'm not. I. I. I there, well, actually, I think it'd be a fraud action. Well, that's what I. That's why. I'm There's no replevin here. It's only one of them gets property. And replevin's for real property, a personal property too, isn't it? I don't think you replevin for land. So we can't say here that like, like the rule from leaving the parties like a month of her clause. I have. Well, what does Luthi have to do with this case? But this was Aaron's question a minute ago. The existence of the Joker deed in the Grand Tour Index would put her on notice. Either one, record or inquiry, they're about the same thing. No, there's no. I don't think Luthi's relevant here. And, and again, I don't know. If I've mentioned replevin this semester, have I? I don't think I've ever used that word. Maybe I did. I'm not. I don't think I did. Um, try not to bring stuff in from other semesters of law school. It's probably not correct. Well, we talked about that. That's fair game. But I don't think I talked about replevin this semester. Again, that that's a remedy for personal property, not not real property. And so I don't think it, it matters here. Yeah. So I put in it that there's an assumption that Alfred is a the Tennessee Day purchaser because the fact that there was a secret purchaser prior to him. I think that's right. Yeah. Is that necessary to put that in there? or? I, I think I, you can. I don't think you have to, but I think you can put that. Other questions at number one? Agent number two? All right, let's do number two. I mean, I'm sorry, we did number two. Let's do number three. Oh, I didn't do the Model A plus answer. I'm sorry. I skipped that one. But, <clears throat> um, and I apologize in advance. This answer cites a couple of cases that are no longer in your casebook, so they won't make sense to you, but they, they were there. So it says, under a race no statute, again, the first two sentences are just a waste of space. I don't need them. Don't tell. I know this. I, you don't need to tell me this. So here, the answer begins. Alfred will argue that he was the first to purchase fraud acre. And like the necessary steps to record as D before B recorded. Oh, come, oh my goodness, this sentence. Don't please never do this in, a, in an exam or a brief or else. Short sentences. <laughs> here's A's argument. Here's B's argument. Here's C's argument, right? Don't give me this long sentence. I have no idea what this sentence is. It's just, it's just, it's just words that, 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 that lost their way. This was a rough semester, apparently. Look, look, can I tell you something? I guarantee you, when I was in 2018, showing the 2016, I said, Professor Black, was this the A-plus answer? I'm like, yes. Happens every year. Okay, Batman will argue, don't worry about the Hughes, that he was a bona fide purchaser without notice because Alfred's night recorded. Catman will argue that she was without notice because she probably conducted a title search starting the grantee index, but did not see Alfred's name before purchasing Fraud Acre. Additionally, she'll argue that the clerk's mistake rendered the recording of the deed defective and valid based on Mr. Smith. You don't have that case, it's fine. So she was first recorded without notice. What's also lacking here is an answer. How should the court resolve the case? The court should rule for Alfred because he was a BFP and he recorded first. I need that sentence if you want a, if you want a perfect score or even a good score, but you should have that answer. Alfred was a BFP, recorded first, he wins. Good. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so Harper and also the item Sonan's case, or the buyer. But what burden do you impose on the person doing the title search to look up in both books? Well, there's no, no, I, I'm sorry. Item Sonan's is not relevant here, but the issue in that case is what burdens do we impose on a person doing a title search? So here you have to search for all both books from top to bottom. I don't think that's an unreasonable search. There's only one variant of the name. It's Joker. You don't have to look at you know different misspellings or whatever else. It's an easy enough name to spell. I didn't like that movie, Joker. I don't like it. I don't like it. Yeah. It was a new Joker movie. It wasn't like a Batman movie. It was a Joker movie. I don't like it. All right. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. That's a fair point, yeah, because of immunity, you can't sue government officials. And I think we, we should say that if you're a citizen and you bring a paper to a government office, you're entitled to rely on that, that that was actually a valid recording. 
You could argue that because the document was recorded properly, he doesn't meet the race notice statute. I think that's a weaker argument. The better argument is he's a citizen, brought a government document to the government, and they didn't do their job. He can still meet the statute. That, that's how I would approach it. And that's a good policy argument. Yeah. Um, can you on the step one you can put the FD instead of the NFI? You can. I don't know what that means. Like saving two words. Congratulations. I mean, just just don't give me weird acronyms. I don't I don't know. But BFP, I, I think I've used that one in class a hundred times. Let's... I think the method is a folder, but in this question, in this answer, mm -hmm. it starts with saying the names and then switches to just saying B and C. That's fine. That's fine. And I deliberately give them so that there's not there's not like Adam, Alex, and Amy in the same question. That would just be very mean. I, I every every letter is only one person. And usually in alphabetical order, I try at least. Good. Uh, see number three. Making good time. All right, number three. Okay, this is the mortgage question. Batman sought to purchase Bat Acre at a price of one hundred thousand dollars. Okay. By the way, if I give you the purchase price, that's a pretty good signal that that's also the fair market value. I mean, not perfect, but that that's a that's a good signal. <clears throat> He paid ten thousand for his down payment of his own savings, meaning he needs ninety more. Gotham Bank gave Batman a note for eighty thousand dollars, which was secured by first mortgage. Arkham Bank gave Batman a note for ten thousand, which was secured by a second mortgage. So he had eighty and ten. Batman paid five thousand to Gotham and five thousand to Arkham. Batman found hard times, boohoo, and defaults on the mortgage. Okay. So what comes next is a variant of the Murphy versus FinDef Corp case, right? Remember that case involved one bank who showed up for the auction, representative of that bank, how much they bid, the exact amount due on the note. Okay, here the facts are different. Gotham moves to foreclose at the sale of his one bidder, a representative from the other bank, Arkham. And what does he bid? <clears throat> less than the amount owed. Again, there was 80,000, I'm sorry, 75,000 and 20, um, 75,000 and 5,000 owed. He bids only 50. After the sale, Gotham and Arkham go against the bank. I'm sorry, they go against the buyer and they try to seek a deficiency judgment. <clears throat> Batman moves to set aside the foreclosure. How should the court resolve this conflict? You need to tell me. Yes, the court should set aside the foreclosure, or no, the court should not set aside the foreclosure. Right? I need an answer to that question. So, how do we go about answering this question? Right? Uh, the first thing to keep in mind is was the foreclosure sale actually valid? You talk about duties of good faith, you know, diligence, and so on. If only one buyer shows up and it just so happens to be the rep from the other bank, and he bids an amount far below the amount owed on the note and far below the amount actually the, of the purchase price, that's a sign that maybe this is not a good auction. They should set a reserve price or maybe reschedule it altogether. But they went ahead with it. So I think under Murphy, you can argue that this was not a valid foreclosure sale and it should be set aside. Okay. There's also the issue, excuse me, of the deficiency judgment, right? And I mentioned in the instructions, which I know you all read carefully, they were applying the Texas deficiency judgment statute, which speaks of the fair market value. I don't tell you what the fair market value is, but if you know a purchase price was barely a year ago, uh, that's a good signal that uh, that's the fair market value. And since the price was roughly half the fair market value and much less was on the note, then that, that might be um, a, 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 a bad sale. But it's possible that you can actually have a court order um, uh, that Batman pay up. So what will be owed? Well, the first bank was owed 75000 50000 came in. That means 25000 is owed. The second bank got nothing for the foreclosure sale. So Batman would owe 5000 If you think the foreclosure sale, the, the deficiency judgment is valid, you would say that. 25 for the first bank, 5 for the second one. I think the better answer is a foreclosure sale is invalid altogether, so you don't even get to the deficiency judgment. 
Okay. Questions number three. Yes, Lance. <laughs> you're smile. You're smiling. I argued opposite of what you said. Okay, that you can do that. You tell me what you write. Uh, I said if it is assumed that Gotham Bank adequately advertised the foreclosure sale and the only bid made was by Arkham of fifty thousand dollars, and that was considered a fair market price, the amount given so low that not the Okay, I can, I can live with that. That's good. Yeah. In real life, just because it's sold for fifty, I mean, don't they do this kind of stuff all the time? Putting in half the value of the property. Well, I mean, he's on a double mortgage, right? Also, right? oh, so maybe pay too much. You're saying? Yeah. You know, I, I think if this happened in real life, the fact. What I was thinking about this question is the two banks were working together. So it wasn't like in Murphy where the, the, the bank was basically repping itself. But here, it was, well, yeah. No, that's fine. You use Murphy. But I think that it's a little bit different than Murphy because the two banks knew that they had this mortgage situation, right? Bank number one had the foreclosure, and just so happens bank number two shows up. And that's, that was designed to avoid the Murphy holdings. Oh, you can't have, you can't have a Gotham rep there. So they sort of split it up. And they may have even worked it out in the back. We don't know. But I, I, I what Lynn said is just fine. Yes. So <clears throat> could you use the portion of the Murphy holding that said there's a duty of due diligence to obtain a fair market value price? Yes. I That's what I was getting at, right? And I don't know that they did that because they kept the bid so low. But then again, it was not Gotham Bank placing the bid, but the, the, the suspicion is they were working together. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I, I definitely did it that year. And I'm, I, I think I, I know I gave it that year because uh, I remember people were complaining about this uh, that year. Uh, let me just double check. Um, it was class five. Maybe I didn't. Anyway, if I didn't, it would not be the end of the world. For, I, in other words, every semester I write a new exam, so I wouldn't do that this year if I didn't do it. I always check with my notes what I gave you, but I think I did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you'd be good. You know, maybe I didn't. I did in the past, so no big deal. What else? Quick. So again, normally Batman would be I think so. But is it fair to say that uh, Yeah, I think mean, you could say that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I laid the facts out that looks like they were, they were probably colluding. That's, that's why I was, I was sort of hinting at. But you know, if you didn't see it, that, that that's fine. All right, let's look at the model answer. This one I think was actually good. Um, as the first and priority lender, Gotham Bank will argue is entitled to proceeds from the sale to cover its loss of seventy-five thousand dollars, because Batman was only sold for fifty. A bad was sold for fifty thousand. Their losses will not be completely covered, and Arkham should not receive anything. And Arkham was a second bank. Gotham and Arkham would seek deficiency judgment for $25,000 and $5,000, respectively. Correct. However, Batman argued under Murphy that the banks have fiduciary duty to him to, 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 do, do, uh, to do due diligence in obtaining a fair price for Batacre. Because Bat Batman bought for $100,000, it's not likely that $50,000 is a fair price, <laughs> especially because it does not appear that the bank gave any extensions to Batman, uh, was diligent, this is the opposite of what Lynn said, was diligent in advertising the sale. And there was only one buyer rep from Arkham Bank at the sale. If the court doesn't set aside the foreclosure sale for it to be sold at a more fair price, then Arkham and Gotham may still be prevented from covering all their losses under the Texas statute. Gotham's judgment may be more limited to the difference between the balance and the FMV fair market value of the property. Arkham, although second priority, will to recover only after Gotham. Yeah. I think that was actually probably a nine or a ten right there. Questions at number three. Murphy. 
And they got the statue, which apparently I didn't give you this semester, but they cited the statute also. Yeah, this is why I can never use questions from year to year, because every year I do different things. It's never the same. Uh, I mean, we have different casebook for one thing, but I, I always have to do different things. That's why I tried so hard to keep both you and the day section on the same page, because if it was different, I, I would, it, it'd, be, it'd be impossible to actually grade you. Yes, ma'am. I don't have the statute, but it does say provide additional judgment, so it's still up to the top. Yeah. Just not. Yeah. Sure, so squeaky. You know, that's probably the WD-40 used to be there. Remember, there used to be a camp WD-40 there for the longest time? That's right, why? It's a really squeaky chair. Now it's gone. And I threw out that, remember that handle thing? I finally threw it out. It just, it didn't. It just kept appearing. Uh, can you do question four? Let's do question four. Question four. Let's go. Joker announces that he wishes to open an insane asylum, an arc acre for people with mental disabilities. If you didn't know, the comic book Arkham Asylum is a famous asylum in the comic books. He didn't need to know that, but it's there. Um, the Gotham City Council promptly enacts a land use regulation. That allows the zoning board to deny a permit for insane asylums with five more residents if the public safety requires it. Unless the asylum builds a 100-foot electric fence around the perimeter. Sounds a little bit excessive, right? Um, the city found that criminals often congregate around these group home, outside these group homes. And currently, there are no other insane asylums in Gotham City. Joker challenges the constitutionality of the land use regulation and the district court. How should the court resolve it? And again, only constitutional issues. I don't want you talking about statutes. I'll explain why in a few moments. So let's walk through this, this question one step at a time. First off, did Joker ever actually open the facility? No. Did he build it? Did he apply for a permit? No. So this is not like the Pennsylvania Northwestern case, and maybe amortization where he has to close it. He never opened it in the first place. Also, if you think in terms of like dibbies and investment back expectations, he never did anything, right? There, there is no, there's no investment at all. He just wanted to. He announced he wanted to do it. The next thing to think about is this a variance, or is this a special exception? So if you remember, variances are designed to Deal with unexpected hardships, right? Where there's a problem that might arise and you give discretion to the zoning board. By contrast, special exceptions are different, right? Special exceptions are different. Special exceptions are designed for foreseeable problems, but they're very mechanical. If you do X, Y, and Z, you get your special exception. They can't have things like discretion with a special exception. So what happens here? The reg says you have to look if there is the public safety requires it. Can a zoning board under a special exception consider the public safety or the public good? I think the answer is no. Right? That's a violation of delegation problem. And if you remember the Cope case, you can't have a special exception that looks like the, the general welfare or public safety and so on. That goes too far. So I think the statute's unconstitutional on its face, right? You can't delegate to a zoning board the power to decide what's in the special interest. There's also the issue of the 100-foot fence, which seems kind of insane, right? Uh, but one student in my other class actually raises under the exaction issue, right? You're basically making them spend money under Kuntz for basically an accompaniment to, a, um, uh, to get a permit, right? If you want a permit, you got to build this thing. So is, this, you know, is there a, a nexus between uh, having a 100-foot fence and a group of five people? That seems a little excessive. Right, I mean, we're talking about like a five foot fence or a hundred foot fence. That's very tall, right? Um, so I think that the under the Nexus test is probably taking here also. But then again, he didn't really build anything, so it's not clear if he actually even applied for the permit. But but, but some people may have thought about that. Uh, there's also a First Amendment issue under Village of Belterra, be Boris, the right of association. Uh, is there a right people to associate with each other? This is a group home, but it's also for mentally insane people, so probably not. Uh, people talk about the city of Cleburne case, which I didn't actually teach. Did you do that in con law? No, you didn't. So, which, so don't worry about it. 
but there was a there was this famous Supreme Court case about a group home for mentally disabled people. I think I covered it that year. I don't think I talked to you about it. So if you don't know it, that's fine. <laughs> Cleburne versus Cleburne Living Center. Yes, in Cleburne, Texas. Yes. You did you didn't cover it. You did in property one? All runs together, I know. I used to teach in Colin, I stopped because it's it's an 80s case and it's dated. Um, all right. One last issue, spot zoning. The question says there's only one insane asylum in the city and they're applying to this one place. And under the due process clause, spot zoning might be unconstitutional. This is the city of Rochester case. So don't forget about that. All right. Questions number four. Yes, sir. Um, Okay, well, number one, wasn't a, a pretty thematic um, overview in this class is that courts generally put deference to zoning provisions? They do. Okay. So then I guess in this case, um, we're looking at something, I, I feel like the rule is more coming from Pennsylvania Northwest regarding amortization period. Mm -hmm. And but the facts here don't support They that. do not. Correct. So I don't feel like um, what's named Grover. What about the delegation for private, uh, for, for, for public uh, security, public safety? Can you do that under a special exception? Well, can, can the zoning board? Can the legislature delegate to the zoning board the power to condition a permit on deciding what's in the public safety? It's damn relevant. Yes, it is. It's very relevant because if the special exception delegates power unlawfully, that this, then the statute is unconstitutional. You can't enforce it. But the main issue is that this is a retroactive enforcement of zoning. Why is it retroactive? Because they, because his cause of action would be if I build this, it's going to be impermissible, or I'm not going to get a permit. Right, right. So retroactive is the wrong word. What I think you'd have to say is because Joker never applied for a permit, he can't challenge it as being unconstitutional, okay. right? And, and this, this is more of a Fed courts question than a, than a, than a question about um, or a procedural question. Can you challenge an ordinance if they've never actually been subject to it, right? In other words, let's say he applied for a permit, he was denied. At that point, he could probably go to court and sue. But you could probably also go to court and say, I intend to build it, and this statute's unconstitutional. I think that would still work also. So I don't think retroactive is the right way of looking at it. Yeah, let me let me do the model answer, and I'll come back to you in a minute, okay? So here's the model answer, which I wasn't crazy about either. I think it's wrong in a couple of regards. Uh, again, I know you're dunking on this A-plus answer. Someone will dunk on your answer in two years, so it, it'll happen. No, it's it's fine. Uh, Joker will argue that this is an unconstitutional use of the police power. The city council will argue this is a valid regulation because it's a power to regulate health, safety, welfare, morals of the people. The council will argue under Euclid that there is a rational basis for this regulation because criminals congregate on group homes and threatens public safety. Euclid's not really the right case, right, I don't think, uh, at all. Uh, Joker will argue under PA Northwestern. By the announcing he was going to open the asylum, he should be grandfathered in. Again, that's wrong because it was non, there was nothing built. Uh, Joke will argue on COPE, his regulation is delegation of powers. That's correct, right? Because you can't give a special exception involving public safety. That part at least is right. Joke will further argue there's exclusionary zoning, like in Mount Laurel. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm, I mean, that's, Look, you can make the stretch that Mount Laurel is about disadvantaged groups, right? And people with mental handicaps are, in fact, disadvantaged. That is, I think, what Sue was getting at. It's not a clean answer. That's not, it's not a, it, they would have to sort of unpack that, but explain why it's like Mount Laurel. You can't say, this case is like Mount Laurel, period. Give me a sentence explaining why. Uh, but the Belterra, that is correct, right? There might be a association at play there. <clears throat> so I think this is probably, I know you're going to hate me, probably seven or an eight. This was not a great answer. Maybe an eight. Maybe a nine if I was feeling generous that day, but probably an eight. It, it's hard because when I'm grading an example, there might be some really good stuff and some bad stuff also. And I can't like slice and dice an answer and just give you the good parts. 
So I gave you the good with the bad. There's some good stuff in there, also some bad stuff. Yeah. Nick, was your hand up? No, I, I talked about Tommy and the Okay. Because Tommy is like the one who was talking. Right. But it says that they canceled. I don't think that case is relevant. I think it's wrong because nothing was built. The Pennsylvania Northwestern case was about amortization there. They say, you need to shut your building down immediately. Is there a compensation requirement? The answer was yes, but here nothing was actually actually built. A lot of students missed that and just assumed it was already built because he said he announced his intent to open it, which is... I think COPE is good um, about the special exceptions. I think Belterra, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Belterra is good about the right of association. Um, you might want to talk about Kuntz with the uh, with the permit and the exaction. I think that would also be relevant. Yes, sir. That wasn't in the case at all. Well, I talked about a related issue with zoning bookstores, but the case the case didn't even mention the First Amendment. So, but this type of the associational rights, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I took the uh, thing where it said the city council found the criminals often trying to get outside. I used that in my Kings analysis to say that they did their due diligence and they came up with that, which gave them that a nexus. I think I think you can make that argument. We still have to think about proportionality as one hundred foot fence proportional. That even if there are criminals hanging around, do you really know what a hundred foot electric fence? I mean, that just seems like a really, like a really. I mean, a hundred feet seems really high, guys, right? I mean, I, what's the height of this building? I don't know, but uh, it's basically like you know many like at ten floors up. I mean, it's that's that's a huge, that's a huge fence. So if you have the nexus, you have the proportionality. That that'd be how how I'd probably spin that. But again, he never actually applied for the permit. But again, in Coons, he didn't apply for the permit either. So, uh, right, because he never actually, there was never actually a denial because he didn't do it. So it's not exactly Coons, but it's in the ballpark. All right, number four, questions. Questions? Let's see what the student wrote. No, I read the student's answer. All right, anything else on number four? All righty, let's do number five. Uh, as always, number five is what I call the policy question. But it doesn't mean just make stuff up. I want you to bring in your knowledge of cases, knowledge of authority, especially in this one. So it says, often land use regulations closely implicate questions of race, socioeconomic status, and property values. State governments may make zoning decisions based on some, but not all these factors. Discuss what role courts should play, both in the federal and state constitutions, in scrutinizing such land use regulations. All right. Now, notice I mentioned three specific questions race, socioeconomic status, and property values. Just look at all three of those. That's a good thing to do, right? I'm giving you three specific things I want you guys to talk about. Okay? Everything okay, Greg? Very good. You can go back and forth, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. All right. Uh, so all three of those values are at play here. All right. So let's take a look at what we can talk about. Uh, what do we have on court scrutinizing property laws with regard to race? Well, you have Mount Laurel, right? You got Shelley versus Kramer. Uh, in the Kelo case, Justice Thomas dissent discussed the relationship between eminent domain and race. So there's a lot of authority you can bring in there. Socioeconomic status, right? Uh, Thomas's Kelo dissent also talked about eminent domain focuses on poor people, can't fight back. Think of the story in New London, where you have these sort of these blue collar people being rolled over by Pfizer. Okay. Um, we also have, you know, a village of Euclid, right? With, with regulations being used to try to uh, uh, perhaps keep out poor people, right? It, it, the entirety of Euclidean zoning is to keep, uh, in fact, we go to the next one, keep property values very high. Um, 
uh, in your reading, you have the Palm Beach case, right? Aesthetics, so things look like for property values. I gave you the Stoyanov case. Remember the house was kind of like a triangle? That's another one. Uh, you can also talk about, I think, even the religious cases like Rifra and Liupa, right? Where various religious uses are used to exclude people. There are a lot of directions that you can take this question, and I wouldn't even pretend to give you all of them, but these are pretty wide open. But you have to ground, but if you're right, in some, uh, in some authority. All right, who wants to ask about number five? Number five. Uh, so for the A plus answer, then they'll generate some discussion. All right, this is the A plus answer. I think, I think it was actually pretty good. Under both federal and state constitutions, again, I mentioned state constitutions because that's Mount Laurel, the state case in New Jersey. The courts have a duty to ensure that they uphold the equal protection of citizens, prevent discrimination and regulation under the facade, a oh, big word, the facade of regulating something legitimate like property values. However, the court's ability to do so is limited by the overwhelming precedent established of applying rational basis in land regulation disputes. For example, in Euclid, Euclidean zoning had the secondary effect of relegating people of certain socioeconomic status to certain zones by virtue of the requirements on lot and house size. Good. Right? That's exactly how Euclidean zoning works. Good. As well as what activities may be conducted there, residential versus commercial use. The court upheld this because there was a rational basis for regulation based on property values. It's getting a little, bit, a little bit wordy, but I get the picture. The importance of property values also went out. What some has argued is a constitutional right to free expression in cases like Stoyanov, where the regulation of aesthetics was couched in the regulation of property values. Correct. Additionally, the dissent in Belterra would argue that a stricter standard of scrutiny should be applied when zoning ordinance burdens fundamental rights of association. Good. Overall, courts should make sure to scrutinize whether the zoning ordinance, blah, 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 regulate legitimate value, like property values, blah, 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 blah. Didn't mention Mount Laurel, I was kind of surprised by that. Didn't mention Shelley against Kramer, that seems like an obvious one. Didn't mention Kilo, seems like an obvious one. But this is probably, again, it's probably a nine, maybe even a 10. It's pretty good. So, again, an imperfect answer, still can't nine or 10 points. All right, one number for 10, five. In the red book, you have. I don't remember. We read it. It's on the syllabus. Do you remember reading it? That was a New Jersey case, remember? Yeah, I mean, it's in the book. We read it. I once had a student who came to me the last day. I was like, can you just explain the class to me? And basically, that, that was the question. Like, can you just explain the semester to me? Like, yeah, sure. Uh, good luck. Um, I do have a question that's like not really Please. Like a tip, um, so I know I'm trying to figure out how to work it. I know that we're using like writing your rules and using them kind of like as like a test part. What is a tip? What do you mean tip? I'm not sure what you're saying tip. Like, I, I, okay, I'll say for me, I like sometimes writing rules because then it makes sure that I don't miss anything in the analysis. Okay. So for a person that writes like that, how do you su suggest we? Practice to not like you know because that like I can see myself putting those rules in there and I know they're not and then delete them. Do you want to write them? You can delete them. But that's time you're spending. Right. So, so like, I would jump right to the analysis, or or I can give you this one tip: rewrite the rule statement with the names. You know, instead of just saying, uh, you know, a race notice requires good faith and being the first record. Say Alfred recorded first and uh, uh, was good faith. Just put the person's name in there instead. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, you can write rule statements, and that's very nice, but you're not getting credit for it, because I know you can copy those from your notes. So, look, I know there's some professors who require to memorize rule statements. I know I know that's how a lot of them work, and it's a different deal. Uh, I mean, you may know this, but the bar exam is moving towards being more open book. I mean, you're, you're, you're aware of these trends, right? Where there are going to be components of the bar where they give you basically a packet of materials, and you have to basically work from those materials, and there are going to be rules, there are going to be statutes, there are going to be things in there. So... Even the bar is moving away from strict, strict memorization on some components. Um, so I've always had open book exams because I, I just I I'm not a good memorizer. I don't memorize things. I remember things. I'm not a good memorizer. You know, memorize this this elements of this word verbatim, word for word, just in those exact words. I've just never been able to do that in my life. Just my brain doesn't work that way. 
Question is number five. Question is number five. Going once, twice, three times. Okay. Questions on the exam? Yes, Brian. No question on the exam. Stambowski? Who was that? Seller. Okay. Um, but in that case, there was ghosts there. So he obviously didn't create the ghosts. Right. The, the court didn't have to decide whether, in fact, they were ghosts. But the, the holding was basically, it's basically on a stopple. The the, the the seller had previously talked with these ghosts. He's basically stopped from denying them. So as a matter of law, the house was haunted. And once he disclosed it to some people, he didn't disclose it to the buyers. He found that was a violation of, the, of, of duty of good faith. Yeah? Okay. I'm trying to figure where I'm at as far as point. Uh, I mentioned only uh, Mount Laurel mostly and Rodeo Del Terrace. I mean, I have to see the answer, but, you know, that's seven, maybe eight. Yeah. We send you uh, some writing over the weekend. You'll have a chance to look at all. Not at this point in the semester. If you've done it like before, but not, 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 I, the reason why is I have to write the exam now. And, and I don't want to start giving feedback after I've written the exam. Um, no, I, you have plenty of opportunities to do it and just not now. Uh, yes, Tamara. I have no idea. I didn't write it yet. I deliberately don't write till after today. That way I, I can plead ignorance. I have no idea. I haven't even thought about it yet. I'll think about it tomorrow. Do you like cartoons? Yeah? Okay. Uh, it makes it a little bit softer, so it's not so harsh. Some of my con law exams are like, it's a civil war. You know, like, you know, we're probably making a little fun. <clears throat> All right. Other questions on the exam? Or the class in general. Only once, twice. All right. Thank you so much for a great semester. I appreciate it. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I would like to also about standby. So, it's more of a general question. But, you know, 